Welcome to CAS 133 Columbia Gorge Community College, the Dalles, Oregon, Mrs. Hewitt instructor. Now this video is going to be a little bit longer because there are a lot of things going on during week 10. So please make sure you do listen all the way to, through to it because there are some things that are going to get you if you don't. So let's get started. Um, for additional resources, I actually just set it up so you go do your own search of YouTube for access 2013 videos. There are a ton of how-to videos, the textbook files, then I've got some more videos that I've put in down here for you. As we move down into this, you're going to have your directions video, um, information about the access project is really important that you read before you start. I see some things are kind of out of order. I will get some things shuffled around. But it's really important you read this page because it's going to save you from disasters. It is a reminder that you must successfully complete one project from each software in Office, including Access. There is only one Access pro project. This is it. Um, so you must complete it and you must do corrections after it's done if you get a D or an F. Go slow, make sure you give yourself extra time, make sure you have a machine with access. And I'm going to be honest, for those of you trying to use Office 2010, I really don't think you're going to be able to use access with 2010. There's some huge changes between the programs, and when I tried it, I was not able to do it. And so therefore, while I'm nowhere near an expert in access, I've done it probably more than you have. So I highly, highly suggest you find a 2013 machine to work on that has access. Uh, make sure you match the book exactly. Something as simple as a capital or not having a capital can be the difference between when you import an Excel file into access, having it go and getting to type it all by hand because you have a little tiny boo-boo and I mean a little boo-boo. It doesn't take much of extra space, an extra period, a missing capital, an extra capital. You also have to download the Excel spreadsheet first. I'll show you how to do that so you can get that um, so that you are going to be able to have it to use. So let's kind of walk you through a little bit of what is a database and why are we even messing with this? Well, one, we have to mess with it, so it's required in the class. So that's our first why. But what is a database? Well, just Wikipedia has a fairly decent di database explanation. It's an organized collection of data. It's typically organized to model aspects of reality in a way that supports processes requiring information, availability of hotel rooms, or... Um, Google searches. Every time you type it in here, you don't have to wait in line. Google does you all at once. And so if five people happen to, 5,000 people happen to type a search word in at the same time, you don't have to get in a queue and wait for your turn. After 4,999 is done, then yours is searched. No, it does it all at once because it's a database. Also, eBay is a database. So when you look something up, and I picked this partly because it had this bid on it. And so if I wanted to bid on it, and you wanted to bid on it, and four other people in class wanted to bid on it, and we're putting those in and we're hitting place bid, place bid, bid, place bid, access is basically, or the database, access is just a brand of a database, is processing all those informations at once to figure out who's, I mean, it's by milliseconds a lot of times, to figure out who's going to get that bid. We didn't have to get in line and do it at one at a time. We're able all to do it simultaneously from wherever we're sitting by a computer, cell phone, whatever you're using, tablet, etc. A database can handle multiple requests all at the same time. It saves everything as it comes in and goes through it. It does not wait for you to reach up and hit the Save As button, which is good for a database, not so good for students that have no clue what they're doing and want the Oops Undo button. It doesn't exist. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when would access be used? Well, like I mentioned last week, not all office programs have access. Access is not commonly used in a home setting. It's not commonly used in a school setting. It's not commonly used any place but small businesses. Now, obviously, if you are running Google or eBay or some of those types of things or running the hotel database so that you can find out who's got what rooms open, those types of things are going to use probably a lot bigger, more powerful database than even Access is. Access is going to give us enough trouble. One thing to think about as you do this, you're going to find some learning curve, to put it mildly, and you're going to discover some things like it saves it all at once and you can't back up and undo. You've got to be really careful as the administrator of a database. It's not a beginner's thing. I know we are beginners, but really if you're going to administer a database, it is not a beginner's operation. You need training. You need a full class in it. You need a college degree in just databases and computers if you're going to be the data manager for a corporation or a company of some sorts. One example is, you know, school districts notoriously have money problems. I mean, that's something that just goes on. So a few years ago, they were looking for places to cut money in the Dallas School District, North Wasco County School District. And I heard somebody say, well, they've got this data person. We don't need, they don't need a data person. Just get rid of that position. They're just sitting there collecting a paycheck. Let a secretary do it, whatever it is. Well, whatever it was, he's the guy that runs the database. So you show up at work in the morning and you're going to do your attendance or you're going to put in your grades or you're accessing your grade book and it doesn't work. Guess who you call? The database person and he has or she has to get it fixed so that you can access to do those things. Uh, parents need to be called. Kids in the office throwing up. Parents need to be called. Databases where that information is pulled up from. Your kids down in the lab and they're doing a typing program and the typing program remembers what they did this time, last time, the next time. They can sit at different computers each time they do it. It's because it's in a database. It's not being saved on the computer. It's being saved in a database somewhere in the cloud, wherever the server is that's doing that. So databases are very, very, very common. They're very, very complicated. Every time you get an airplane ticket, every time you rent a car, hotel rooms, I mean, anything that's constantly changing that multiple people can access at the same time, you're talking about a database. Um, grocery store, running over that scanner, that's a database that that scanner's pulling up. So. If you're the secretary and you hear somebody say that brilliant sentence of, oh, let the secretary do it, uh, yell, scream, jump up and down and let it be known that there is no way on this earth that a, a regular secretary is going to be able to do a database administrator job. They are not even similar and you have nowhere near the training to be able to do it. Now, if you're going to run one for your little private business at home, take the full access class that CGCC offers, and you probably could do a nice job of using access for a home business or a small business that you're involved with. It would probably work really well for you. That's what it was designed for. I know my aunt had her daughter set up one for the community concert series that she was president of and doing all the records and everything. It worked great for her. And once it was set up by somebody that knew what she was doing, just to put data in and take data out was really easy. It's the setup and managing the back end of it, being the administrator of it that's a bear. And you're going to be the administrator of this database that you're going to make this week. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, Remember that you need to complete it with a C. Um, 
it can be done if you just slow down. I usually tell students, sit on your hands, maybe not quite literally, and read the material in that section before you touch the mouse. Then when you touch the mouse, it's going to make a lot more sense. So we've got a couple of things I want to walk you through with this. First thing is, where do you get this Excel file? Access wants you to actually take an already completed Excel file and basically upload it into Access to get the data in. What a sweet thing to be able to do. You can go in, get an Excel file you're already using, and basically make it just jump itself right into Access and not have to type it all. Sweet, sweet tool. The problem is any boo-boo in it, as mentioned in the tips and tricks, means you don't have it work right. It doesn't happen. And so if it doesn't happen, you're going to have to type it in. So your student files are right here. You're going to do your downloads. You're going to put them wherever you normally put them, whether you put them on a flash drive, whether you put them on your hard drive. Since this is my computer, I can put it on my hard drive with absolutely no problem. And so that's what I'm going to do once I get to my hard drive. It's under here someplace. And once this gets finished downloading, I'm going to pull it over, drop it on my desktop, because that's what I tend to work from. And then I'm going to take that file out of there. You cannot work with any file that's inside a zipped folder. So, uh, one moment please, the operator's not happy. That's me. That's the Excel one. I was up a row too high, so let's do that again. Here's for access. And if you were sitting there going, oops, I think she's in the wrong place, you were right. My mouse had bounced. And I should have known because it took way too long to download. So you're going to open this up and you're going to look around here and it's this customer data is what you're going to want. So you're going to grab it, you're going to set it on your desktop, throw it on your flash drive, whatever makes you a happy camper. And then you're going to find the thing and you're going to open it. Now you can see that you've got the right thing. This looks like customer numbers, customer names, street, city, postal code. Do not change anything. Do not adjust it. Do not type on it. You may have to do uh, enable editing on it. But other than that, leave it as is, exactly as is. And then follow the book steps, step by step by step, to walk you through getting that imported into Access. Once you've got it imported to Access, you're good to go. Now, one of two things will happen. It's either going to import, and you're going to go, yeah, that was so simple. Or you're going to go, rawr, 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 rawr. this is a piece of junk. It doesn't work right. I can't make it to work. It means you have some little, tiny, minuscule difference. And because of that, it's not going to upload. If you have that happen, you just can type it in. It's slower, it's going to take you longer, but it's probably less time than starting over with Access because that's your other option, is you could start all over again and be a little bit more careful as you do it. Um, I'd say it's about 75-25 as far as upload goes and whether it works right when you ask it to jump into Access um, or not. Um, as I said, if you're really careful as you do it, it's going to up your chances. Now, as you get this finished up and you're working on it, I'll let you know what it's supposed to kind of look like. So as you finish this up, you will have some tables. You'll have a, a book rep and a customer table. You'll have a query, which is a customer query. You'll have a form, customer forms, and a re customer financial report. Now, if you have extras in here, because you goofed and you tried it again, delete them. You know, I think it's a right click and delete. I think it's like any other delete that we do. 
um, if you don't have them named correctly, I think it's a right click and rename. So please go in and make sure you do that. This is what the finish should look like. Then I can click on each one and I can open them. They'll come up here in these fields right here. I can look at exactly what you have. So this is kind of how the finished project is going to look. Now for this week we do not have an application project. We only have the learning project. The application project I think is way over our skill level for most of us unless you've taken a full application project. I don't think you're going to find that's an option. I also don't think most of you are going to want to do an app, uh, an extra one of these for the extra credits. So you want to have done it as I told you last week. You'll want to have made sure the PowerPoint one was done and the Excel one was done or if not, maybe that was two weeks ago I told you that actually. If not, at this point you're looking at doing the final extra credit project, which a lot of people really enjoy doing more than the book projects anyway. So now, what am I going to do? I've got Access open. I went to my Start menu, went out to my Microsoft Office, and I'm going to name this right now. So I'm going to say I'm going to figure out exactly where it's going to go. So if I want it on my desktop, that's fine. Or if I want it on my flash drive, you don't want to be moving one of these. Make sure you put it where you're going to want it for the long term. And you'll notice it adds this .accdb. Do not change it. Do not edit it. Do not take the dot out. Do not change the letters or your thing is going to be corrupt. I cannot open it. I cannot fix it. And you're going to have to start over and do it again. There's no recovery from that. Now, I can recover a Word. I can recover an Excel. I can recover a PowerPoint most of the time when you make a naming mistake. I have never been able to recover an access for you. So if you goof the naming, you're going to live with the consequences, which is starting from page one all over again. Hit Create. And there you go. You're ready to go. You start following your directions. Remember, it's going to be saving everything you do as you go. So make sure you've read all the directions in a section before you hit that magic mouse and start actually trying to do it. Because what people will sometimes do is read like the first part of a sentence, kind of try to mouse to do it, and then they read the rest of the sentence and go, oh, that wasn't what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to, you know, whatever, hit a return or put a space in or whatever it was. Oops. And then they're trying to correct it. And most of the time that just means you're going to start over. Notice it didn't ask me to save it either because it's basically been saving itself as it goes. So that's what you need to know for the Access Project. Now, moving on because there's more this week for you. You have an Excel performance test as well. The directions are right here. You're going to open those directions up and kind of walk through it. You are going to be doing out of the back of the book. There's some big yellow pages way in the back. And they say CAP on them. They're CAP projects. They're capstone projects. You're going to basically find page 19. You're going to start at 19. You're going to work through the top of 22. There's kind of a divider at that point. You don't need to go any further than that. It also is going to give you the exact title it needs to be named. It's going to give you the exact keywords that need to be there. It's also going to give you have you put your name in. Okay. Now, one of the biggest reasons people fail this project is because they don't get the numbers to work right. Um, excuse me, but there's no use doing a math project problem to have the wrong answer. Excel is the same way. Your boss is having you do this. It needs to match everybody else's, and it needs to be 100% accurate. If you don't trust yourself, get out a calculator, run the numbers on the calculator, and make sure you have the right answer. 
Remember, I will be looking at your formulas to make sure you didn't just use a calculator and type in the answers, because if you did that, you're still going to fail just the same as having the wrong answer. This can only be uploaded one time. Please make sure you spend time perfecting it and you're absolutely perfectly happy with it before you upload it. Also, the one problem we're having with Excel, good old Excel, it's actually not Excel's fault, it's Microsoft's fault. We'll put the blame where it belongs, is when you need to go into page layout and you need to add a theme. Unfortunately, probably the theme you need is gone. They ask for a metropolitan theme, and if you look at mine, you'll notice I don't have a metropolitan theme. I spent hours on the internet trying to find the template for it, but you just can't for this. Um, I found the one for PowerPoint. I've tried to find pictures of this. It looks like it's probably kind of an orange tint to it. So what you may want to do is come over here. And again, you notice Metropolitan is not, or Metro is not one of the ones in here. But you may want to go with kind of an orange tint or an orange red or red orange type of tint. If you have the Berlin, that would probably work just fine. I'm not sure what you're going to find on your choices. Organic might not be too bad. It's off a little bit, but if that's the only one you have, um, that would probably get you close. But you probably want to go kind of into this orange theme as much as you can um, when you're building that Excel. And there really isn't a picture of it. So, And I don't have an exact picture either, so I'm not sure either. What I'll basically be looking at is did you get it in the orange family? And I'm going to ask that you use a non-serif font. Serif fonts are the ones with the little curly cues to them, where they have the little bit of extra like some of these do. Stick with a really basic one, something like um, that font. That theme comes up with the Garmin. It would work. If I use the other theme, Berlin, it automatically triggers this font, which is also going to be a non-serif font. Advantage would be, Arial would be, um, so if you need to adjust it, you can adjust it to one of these other non-serif fonts. But both of these two themes, if you have either one of those, Organic or Berlin, should come up automatically with a non-serif font for you. Please be very careful with this. Please make sure that you follow all the directions for it before you submit it. You also will not get the chance to correct this. This is one of those tests where you don't get a second run if something goes wrong. What it is is what you get for a grade. What else do you need to know this week? There's actually one more assignment and that's a digital camera assignment. And so you're going to go in here. You're going to download the digital camera information and then you're going to write a summary about what you would want in a camera if you were buying one, what's important to you. For example, for me, there's some things that are really important. I want a rechargeable battery. I'm not interested in a camera where I have to carry, you know, a 50 pack of AAA batteries every place with me. So I want an ion lithium battery that I can recharge. I also want one with an extremely fast shutter speed. I would go insane if I had my husband's camera that I think is very, very slow on the shutter speed. It's not a bad camera, but it's just slow to recover for the next picture. I like it to go da -da 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 -da, and I can rapid fire pictures.
take a series of birds in flight type of pictures. Um, I'd run a digital SLR. One confusion that sometimes t shows up in this, we talk about optical and digital zoom. Optical and digital basically only applies for point and shoot cameras. Some of the bridge cameras have gone to using, and they're expensive, but there are some bridge cameras out there, that's what they're calling them. They've kind of got one foot in the point and shoot world and one foot in the digital SLR world. And those have them, even though they have a fixed lens, they have a measured like a digital SLR. And a digital SLR means it's a single lens reflex camera. Those are the things like the old 35 millimeters where you can push a button, take the lens off, and put another lens on. Money is no, no issue for you at this point because you're not actually spending any, so don't worry about that. We're looking at features and information about digital cameras. Now, if you're somebody that's not too into photography, keep that in mind as you pick fixed features. If you are really into photography, keep that in mind as well. This is your kind of dream camera. Also, please don't tell me I'm just going to use my cell phone or my iPad. That's not the assignment. That might be what you choose to do in real life, and that's fine. But for this assignment, that's not acceptable. So that's another piece of what you're doing this week. And believe it or not, there is one last thing for us to look at for this week. This week is a busy week in a lot of ways. Now, if you were overloaded at that point and you simply can't go any further, as long as you have basically completed the Excel performance, only one upload, the Access Learning Project, I really don't think you're going to need this different version phone because I don't think you can do it with a different version. But I'll leave it there in case you pull a miracle off. Digital camera summary, your reflection in your, your form, and your form reply. The extra credit link is there, but I have never had anybody take on access as an extra credit. However, I did give you the information for the final project. If you feel overwhelmed and you're just like, I can't deal with that right now, it's also in next week's, and you don't really need to start it until next week. But in case you're one of these, I want to know more, I want to know more, I want to know more, I want it now. Okay, here you go. Here's your video in general overview about it. And then, actually, no, that's actually just a, a yeah, okay, it is. And then to go with that, there's more depth on just PowerPoint, more on the final project it, as a PowerPoint. So you have the video and the PowerPoint. You have the final video. I think this one needs to go away. I replaced it with these two. You have the final video here for a photo story, and you have the photo story project. Now, just a couple of reminders on photo story. It will not install on Office 8 or Windows 8. Please don't try to. You'll just mess up your machine. You can use it in the college library. They do have it installed. Or if you have another machine around in the house that you can use or borrow, you can do that. The only thing is it does have to have PowerPoint on it. It doesn't matter what version. I mean, you can go clear back to like 97 PowerPoint. It'll, I think it'll still work. I know from XP forward it sure will. So you can have a pretty old version of PowerPoint on the machine and still be fine, but you do have to have it. It uses some of the same Kodaks. Some people are like, but this is my final project. I can't do something new. Okay, why are you in the class to learn? This is an opportunity to learn. You may never get another one to use this program and learn something new. This is the perfect time to take that opportunity and learn. I know it's a little scary stepping out and using a new program, but it's actually pretty easy to use. And I think the lowest grade I've ever had in a photo story project was a B. So I wouldn't worry too much, because I do take into account the fact that you're stepping out and trying a new program. So please make sure that you do at least give it due consideration as a possibility. Or if you're going to do an extra credit project, think about using 
photo story for it so that you get a chance to give it a try. Um, otherwise, who knows if you'll ever get that chance again. So that takes us pretty much through this week and we'll be heading on into looking into the final project. Now, if you're fall term, you may not find this in week 10 because fall term actually has an extra week in it. And so you may actually find this in week 11. I end up moving it a lot of times. So keep that in mind as you head into um, getting ready for your project. It's usually there the week before finals week. Hope this takes care of it. And if you have any questions, be sure to let me know.